At the start of the 18th century, 80% of Brit Britain's population were farmers. Life expectancy was barely 35, and humans were unable to travel faster than their horses or the wind would allow them. Now, a mere 300 years later, only 1% of Britons now work in agriculture. Life expectancy has doubled to over 80, and we now have flying hunks of metal that can travel halfway across the globe in less than 24 hours. So what caused all of this? The greatest change in human living conditions since the agricultural revolution. We became industrialists. In the late 17th century, Britain was running out of wood. As the population grew and more and more forests had to be cut down, the country turned to coal, which was plentifully available near the surface and therefore cheap to mine. Yet as mines began to go deeper into the earth, they became prone to flooding. Pumps driven by horses could only reach a maximum depth of 30 metres. Huge coal reserves remained untapped. But the solution was right under everyone's noses. In 1698, British engineer Thomas Savory made a shocking discovery. The most important invention in the history of energy production was already in the homes of millions of Britons, cooking their potatoes and boiling their tea. A way to turn heat into motion. By burning fuel, such as the coal abundantly available in a coal mine, Savory could boil water in a closed chamber and build up immense amounts of steam pressure, which, when released, would create a vacuum, drawing in more water. This new pump, which relied on water and heat instead of muscle power, became the first steam engine. Dubbed the miner's friend, Savory's invention, nevertheless, had its limitations. It was only effective to depths of up to 10 meters, requiring huge amounts of coal to be burned to pump even the smallest amount of water. And it was prone to exploding, not qualities a miner would usually associate with a friend. In 1712, engineer Thomas Lukerman improved upon Savory's team steam engine by introducing pistons allowing it to pump from depths of almost 50 metres. Beginning in Worcestershire, the Newcomen engine was soon adopted by hundreds of mines across Britain. But it wasn't until further improvements by James Watt in 1765 that the steam engine stretched out of the mines and into the cotton mills. In the early 18th century, British demand for cotton had reached an all-time high. However, Britain was unable to keep the price of cotton down because it had the highest wages in the world, with Londoners earning the equivalent of 11 grams of silver per day. So Britons turned to India for their cotton. In 1750, India had a population of about 150 million, one of the largest in the world. But they also had some of the lowest wages, only about 2 grams of silver per day. So. They could produce huge amounts of cotton textiles at very low costs and then export them to Britain in very large quantities. So, in order for Britain to keep up with India, they began to industrialise. Inventions such as the flying shuttle in 1733, the spinning jenny in 1764 and the water frame in 1768 not only increased the speed of weaving, but also reduced the number of people needed to operate them. These labour-saving inventions were a huge benefit for Britain's comparatively tiny population of only 6 million. 
but once looms were attached to pistons of steam engines in the 1780s, the industrial cotton mill was born. And by 1800, British cotton production had increased tenfold. This is one of the most logical arguments for why the Industrial Revolution occurred in Britain first, and not in China or India. In 1700, all three countries were at similar points in technological development, but China and India's high populations and low wages meant the production was already very high, so there was no need to industrialise. On the other hand, Britain's small population and high wages meant there was an economic incentive for manufacturers to replace their workers with machines, powered by steam engines. But uh, these steam engines were only cost effective because their fuel, coal, was cheap and abundant. But coal was only cheap and abundant because miners used steam engines to access more coal from deep underground. This is what's called a positive feedback loop whereby an effect amplifies, its, amplifies itself in a cycle. And it was this process that turned Britain into the economic and technological powerhouse of the world. Now that Britain had a cheap and seemingly inexhaustible source of new energy, they used that energy to mass produce a wide variety of goods. For example, sulfuric acid. Before 1750, most clothes were bleached using stale urine. But upon the advent of lead-lined chambers manufactured in coal-powered lead foundries, huge amounts of sulfuric acid could be produced and used as bleach. Another example, aluminium. Discovered in the 1820s, aluminium was extremely difficult to separate from bauxite ore. And so by 1850, despite being the most common metal in Earth's crust, it was more expensive than gold. Subsequently, Denmark's king, Christian X, had an aluminium crown. The United States topped its Washington Monument with a three kilogram aluminium pyramid, and France's Napoleon III created aluminium cutlery and crockery for his most distinguished guests to dine on, while others had to make do with gold. But in 1886, French and American scientists simultaneously discovered that aluminium could be easily isolated from the rest of bauxite by passing electrical current through it. Soon enough, aluminium was being used in disposable sandwich rubbers and cans of mass-produced baked beans all thanks to electricity generated by, you guessed it, coal-fired steam power. Speaking of baked beans, the Industrial Revolution was also responsible for the mass production of food. Similarly to cotton, new labour-saving machines powered by coal were invented to replace workers with automation. This led to not nearly as many farmers being needed in the fields, and so they're left to work in factories in the cities where they canned and processed food rather than grew it. More food led to higher standards of living, the growth of the middle class, and a population explosion, more than doubling Britain's population from 6 million in 1750 to 15 million in 1850. The need to transport large quantities of goods from the countryside to the cities was also created. In the early 19th century, Steam engines were put on rails and wagons of coal were attached. The locomotive had been invented. On the 15th of September 1830, the first fully steam-powered railway was opened between Liverpool and Manchester. A mere 20 years later, there were 10,000 kilometres of track all across Britain. Railways were also the path for telegraphic communication. The first commercial public telegraph line was opened in February 1845 and ran between London and Gosport in the south. By 1848, almost 3,000 kilometres, or about half of Britain's railway network, were also home to telegraphic lines. Today, you don't have to look far to see the impact that the Industrial Revolution has had on our world. The device you're watching this on 
it contains aluminium components that were made cheap by an electrical process invented during the Industrial Revolution. The seat you're sitting on, produced in a factory powered by electricity generated from a steam turbine invented during the Industrial Revolution. The packaged food in your pantry, Industrial Revolution. The car you drive, Industrial Revolution. You're not a farmer, Industrial Revolution. Your lights, your phone, your fridge, your music, your clothes, your timetable, your city, your medicine, your spaceships, your planes, trains and automobiles. All of these technologies made only possible by the Industrial Revolution.